Hello, welcome to the fifth part of this series. In this series of videos, I'm actually taking a very slow approach trying to explain as much as I can about how to write an expert advisor. I'm using a particular strategy for this expert advisor and I'm following that strategy step by step. So I'm showing you each of the pieces of code. And so far we've had four sessions on this and we've reached the point where it actually takes trades. So most of the expert advisor is written. If you haven't seen the earlier parts, you should go back and see them because I'm just going to be picking up where I left off. And where I left off was that we were able to take trades, but I said in the last video that I'd taken some shortcuts. That's because the video was getting a bit long. So I really wanted to just get to the point where trades would be placed, but I left out a few of the features that needed to be added in there. So today, this will be a much shorter video. I'm going to go back, fix those couple of features. I will also show how the current version, which is written for MQL5, differs to MQL4. And I'll take you through the steps to convert it to MQL4 because most of the code written so far is the same for version 4 or 5. And then we'll finally run a test and just see how well this particular expert performs. So let's go into the code now and we'll see what we're doing. I'll just open MetaTrader 5 and I'll open the editor. Now this is the editor and I still have open here the file that we created at part four, breakout set and forget four. I'm going to save that as breakout set and forget five because I'm leaving a trail behind me as I go. And I'll just do a file save as to do that. And now we're at a convenient place to pick up where I left off. I did say that I wanted to allow that if you set one of the take profits to zero, then it would simply indicate don't take a trade. So this particular strategy takes three different trades, each with a different take profit. And I wanted to be able to enter a zero as a take profit and simply not take that trade. So I have here the three statements where I'm placing the trades with take profit one, two, and three. They each call open trade. So the easiest place for me to block out taking the trade is in this open trade function. I'm going to do that very simply by just saying So if take profit, which is this argument passed in, that argument, if that is equal to zero, then return true because this function returns a Boolean and that will at least let it carry on to the next. So if I set take profit one to zero, I can still place trades for take profit two and three. So that's a very simple fix to adjust that. The other thing that I left out was how to set the trade size based on a percentage of equity risk. So I already have the inputs to set the percent, which we're defaulting to 1% on each of these trades. So that would be 3% in total if I took all three trades. But last time I just fixed the volume. So I'm going to go back and change that now. And this is the line that I fixed the last time. I just said double volume equals 0.01. What I want is for that volume to be based on the risk. And to do that, I'm going to create another function. I'll just type the code in here to call it. I'm going to call the function get risk volume when I write it, and I will write it as soon as I explain this. Risk has already been calculated, so that's the percentage of the equity that we want to risk on this trade. And then this math abs price minus SL, I'm using the math absolute because sometimes the price is going to be above the stop loss, sometimes below, depending if I'm buying or selling. So this is an easy way to just get the absolute difference between the price and the stop loss. And that's how much price movement I'm risking. So the two key things I need to be able to calculate a volume based on risk is how much I want to risk, in this case just the percentage, but I'll apply that to the equity in this function, and how far I'm going to let the price move before I hit the stop loss. So now I'll go down to the bottom of the code and we'll write the get risk volume function. get risk volume, it accepts a risk, which is the percentage that I want to risk, and the loss that I'm prepared to take, which is how far I'll let the price move.
Now this is going to be a percentage of equity, so I use the account info double function and the argument to that is account underscore equity and that gives me back my account equity. And then the amount that I want to risk is as simple as multiplying that risk that's been passed in by the equity that I have. So this risk, if I'm risking 1% of my account, that would have been already calculated in the earlier videos as 0.01. So I multiply risk by equity and that tells me how much in my account currency I want to risk. So remember equity will be returned here in your account deposit currency. It has nothing to do with the symbol that you're actually trading at the time. Now another double variable here, tick value, and I'm using symbol info double, arguments to that is the symbol, and then the information that I want. And in this case, I want the trade tick value. Now a tick is the smallest movement that price can have. And what this will tell me is the value that that smallest price movement will be. So if we're talking about say euros that are quoted to five decimal places, that tick size, that last decimal place, that will be the smallest move that can happen. The tick value that comes back here, though, will not be in euros. If your account currency is Japanese yen, then this value will come back as your account currency, uh, the, the deposit currency for your account, uh, regardless of the symbol that you're trading. And that conversion is all done inside the terminal. So this tells me the value of a single tick movement in my deposit currency for this specified symbol. And remember, that's not going to be a constant. It's going to change all the time because the value here depends on the exchange rate between your deposit currency and the two symbols that are quoted that you're trading. So you can't simply capture this once and assume that it won't move. Now, the other thing I want is the size of a tick, and that is tick underscore size. Same function, symbol info double. This time I'm looking at tick size. And for, as I said, euro, that should return 0 0.00001. Uh, for Japanese yen, it would be 0 0.001. This is just a tick size, has nothing to do with actual money. So this is not in your deposit currency or in any other currency. This is just the amount that the price can move in a single tick. Now I'm calculating lost ticks. So this is the number of ticks that I am prepared to lose. So remember that this loss value is the price movement between my entry point and the stop loss. So that might be 0 0.001 of whatever currency I'm trading. So this will be 0 0.001 divided by the size of a tick. And that tells me how many ticks the price has to move before it hits my stop loss. So that's my lost ticks. Okay, so now I'm finally down to the point of simply calculating the volume that I would trade. And this is the volume where if the price went against me by this amount, I would lose this percentage of my equity, approximately. There's always going to be slippage and rounding happening here. So this loss ticks multiplied by tick value, I know the tick value is the value in my deposit currency of a one tick movement. Loss ticks is how many ticks the price has to move before I hit that stop loss. So this gives me the total loss 
for a single lot size. Now, I didn't mention that earlier, but this tick value is the value of a tick movement for a one lot trade. I have the risk amount, which is my percentage of equity. I divide that by this total loss for a one lot trade, and that will tell me the volume that I actually can trade. Now that's going to come back, it's a double, so it could come back with any number of decimals, and it may not be a valid trade lot size. So I need to normalize that to the correct size for the symbol that I'm trading. I have another function to do that, and I'm going to call that function now to change this volume to a normalized volume. And once I've done that, I simply have to return volume. So now I write this normalize volume function. Now first I'm just going to put in a little guard statement. In case the volume passed in is already zero, there's no point in doing any further work. Now this variable I've set up here, double max, that tells me the maximum number of lots that I'm allowed to trade in a single trade and I get there with the symbol volume max argument to the symbol info double function. Along with max, there's a min value, and I get that with symbol volume min. And there's also a step. So, Max is the maximum size of a volume that I can trade for this symbol in one trade. Min is the smallest lot size that I can trade. And step is the increment between individual lot sizes. So normally this would be just the last decimal place, but it's possible that uh, the volume step is 0.1 or 0.2. I've never seen this to be anything unusual, but the value is here, so I'm capturing it just in case. And what this basically means is that all lot sizes must be multiples of step. First part of this function, volume divided by step, so that's my total volume here, and I'm dividing that by the size of a step. So if my volume is two and the step is 0.1, that will give me 20. I'm using math round, because volume may not be a nice even number like two. And what I want to do is round this off to the nearest integer value. So this is going to give me an integer. And I want to round that off to the nearest integer. So that volume of, let's say it's a volume of 2.001. That will still round off to be 20 when I divide that by the step of 0.1. And then I multiply that by step. So my 20 is now multiplied by 0.1. And that gives me a result back of two. So this is a method of effectively rounding volume based on the size of the step. I put that into result. And then I need to make sure that that result is not greater than max or less than min. So I'll just do So if the result that I've got is greater than the max, then I just set it to max. And if it's less than min, I set it to min. For your purposes, you might want to change this so that it's less than min, you set to zero. And effectively, then you can't trade. 
I'm just making sure it stays within this range from min to max. And I think that's everything that I left out last time. Let me compile to make sure I don't have an error here. No errors, that's fine. And that should work now. The next thing I said I would show you is the differences to MetaTrader 4, and there haven't been very many so far. So let me go to the beginning of the code. I mentioned this very early. I think it was in part two. Property strict tells the MetaTrader 4 compiler to use the new version compiler compared to the old version compiler, and that was there for compatibility reasons. This is a harmless statement for MetaTrader 5, so I typically put it into all of my code. I even often put it into include files so that if I do a syntax check on those files, it will know that I'm using the property strict on those files as well. So I generally put this at the beginning of all of my files. That's a harmless change. This piece of code though, include trade.mqh. Trade.mqh is a file supplied with MetaTrader 5. It includes a class that is used for trading and makes trading easier in MetaTrader 5. That file does not exist for MetaTrader 4. MetaTrader 4 trades differently. So if I'm coding for MetaTrader 4, I want to hide that. Now, rather than make a lot of modifications here inside this .mq5 file, the technique that I will normally use when I want a file to be compiled in both MetaTrader 4 and 5 is that I'll have a small mq4 file for MetaTrader 4, a small mq5 file for MetaTrader 5, and then all the rest of the code will go into a single MQH file that is shared by both. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take you through step by step. I'm actually going to create a version breakout set and forget 5A, just so that I don't override this, uh, and then we'll work on that 5A. So that's the breakout set and forget 5A.MQ5. I'll save that. I'll also save it as .mq4, and I'll open the MetaTrader 4 editor in a minute and work on that. And then I'm also going to save it as mqh. This is kind of the long way around of creating it, but uh, it's because I've gone to this point first. Normally I just start with individual files. All right, so now I've opened the 5a.mq5, so that's the MetaTrader 5 file, and the 5a.mqh. What I'll do in the .mq5 file, I'm going to get rid of all of this code because this is in the mqh file. I'm going to put here after the property strict and include for this mqh file. And you can call that include file anything you like, but I typically give it the same name as my main file. And then I'm also going to change these and I just noticed I haven't been updating the version as I go, so I'll fix that next. So this is the MQ5 file. I've taken out all of the code except for these property statements. These statements, if I move those into the include file, have no effect. And then when you load this expert onto your terminal, you don't get the information showing up in that dialog box. So I have to leave the property copyright link version and some others if I want to use those, like the property description, I have to leave those in here. But you'll see that I've replaced the actual values with these and they are going to be hash defines macros that I'm going to set up inside the include file because I've got the include file here before these property statements. Now, typically when you look at a piece of code, you'll see these property statements at the beginning and then all of the code after that. Uh, that's just convention. In this case, I've got all of the code happening in here before the property statements and that still works. So now I'll go to the MQH file and make the few changes in there that I need. Like I said, I leave property strict in there in an include file because that way I can do syntax checks. These properties are going to be hash define. And I called these app underscore. And 
this time I'll remember to change that. Five. I'll make it 0 0.01. So now I've used these defined statements and that's obviously what will come through and replace these. And now I can get down to the point where I'm actually modifying this to work with MetaTrader 4. As I said, this file doesn't exist in MetaTrader 4, this trade.mqh. So I'm only going to include that if this is MetaTrader 5 and there's a convenient macro supplied, which is called double underscore MQL5 double underscore. So hash if def MQL5 simply says if this macro is defined, doesn't test the value of it, just asks if it's been defined, then these lines will be compiled. If that macro is not defined, then these lines will just be ignored. And that macro is not defined in MetaTrader 4. So effectively, when I build this in MetaTrader 4, it'll just ignore these three lines. Scrolling down then, this trade.set expert magic number, trade doesn't exist in my MetaTrader 4 version. So again, I will put hash if def. I'm going to need to replace that with something, but you'll see that a little further down. And now I think the only other place that I have a difference is where I actually place the trade. So here, this statement, trade.positionOpen, that's using the position open method from the trade object. So I don't have a trade object because I'm not using MetaTrader 5, or if I'm in MetaTrader 4, then I don't have a trade object. So I'm going to wrap all of this So this will only be compiled if I'm compiling in MetaTrader 5. And there is a convenient macro for MetaTrader 4 as well. And so I'll go to the MetaTrader 4 editor and actually fill in that line. But uh, that's all of the changes as far as MQL5 is concerned. So I should still be able to compile that if I go back to the 5a.mq5. I can compile and that worked. So now I'll go to MetaTrader 4 and I will edit the MQ4 version of this file. Now this is the MetaTrader 4 editor and I've got the breakout set and forget and this is the 5a.mq4 file. I haven't made any of the changes that I made to the MQ5 file yet. So in fact, I'll just open the uh, MQ5 file. Because that's much easier. You can see that I and remove all of that code. So now the MQ4 file, 58.mq4 and the 58.mq5 files are actually identical. They don't have to be, but they are in my case. And I have this one common file, the 58.mqh. I should be able to already compile that without errors. Yes, but I haven't inserted the code yet to take that trade. So here I am with the MQL4. I'm going to set zero as the slippage. That's not one of the arguments in the MT5 position open. MetaTrader 4 actually takes the magic number here. You'll notice that I put the hash if def around that at the init function, because in MetaTrader 5 it's set once on the trade object. In MetaTrader 4 there is no trade object and the magic number is passed in on each call. Now the order send function in MetaTrader 4 returns a ticket number. And if the order send fails, that ticket number is going to be zero. So I'm testing if ticket equals zero, and then I'm just going to print this. And 
Yes, all of that is still common. Um, just need to indent. If I'm compiling for MetaTrader 4, this will be included. If I compile for MetaTrader 5, this is included. Just put a space between them. Let me go back to the MQ4 and compile that. Possible loss due to type conversion. That is because I've defined INP magic. I think I defined it as a long, so it would be right for MetaTrader 5. In MetaTrader 4, the magic numbers are integers. All I have to do is cast that to an int. Let's try again. And no errors there. So that's the sum total of the difference between the MetaTrader 5 version and the MetaTrader 4 version. And let me just go back. And the three differences were the trade object doesn't exist. So I've taken that out. Obviously, without that C trade class and the trade object, I don't set the expert magic number. So I took that out for MetaTrader 4. And finally, the way that the positions are opened for MetaTrader 5 or orders are sent for MetaTrader 4 is different. So I have small blocks of different code here. Not much difference. So now I've got breakout set and forget 5A for both MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5. And I think it's time to actually run it through the strategy tester once and then we'll finish up for today. I have the MetaTrader 5 strategy test unloaded. There was a short break there because I didn't have enough history data for Dong again, uh, but I'm sure you won't notice any continuity errors here. Uh, as the strategy says, it's Dong again and 15 minute chart. I'm running this from January 1, 2021 to January 1, 2023. So I've got two years of test that I'm about to run. Turn off visual mode because I don't want to see all of that, but I will bring up the graph as it goes. I said in part one that this strategy actually would make a profit. So there you have the graph. Let me look at the back test result. Starting with my $10,000 deposit in two years, I've made a profit of $26,970 with this strategy on Japanese yen on the 15 minute chart. So I'm going to leave it there. We now have a fully working expert advisor. It works in MetaTrader 4 and 5, although I haven't tested it in MetaTrader 4, but I believe it will work and I'll let you test that and tell me if you find a problem. Uh, but we have the same code running in MetaTrader 4 and 5. And I've run the test to prove that it runs. And I've seen that it makes a profit. When I come back with the next session, we'll start to look at things like the options for the strategy where we move to break even when the first take profit closes. And I'll look at some other things around uh, optimization and how that might work for you. Uh, I hope this has been useful to you. If it has, click the like button. And if you want to see more videos, click subscribe and then click the bell icon to be notified when we release new videos. Thank you for watching.